Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We turn in our hymnals to page 664, Naomi Shihab Nye's Making a Fist, a poem that we will want to, uh, to address. Before we get there, though, two places in your annotative notes. First of all, a 2B. Go ahead and look at page uh, 639 for just a moment. Just to remind, we're concentrating on the speaker in poetry. Again, the speaker is not necessarily the poet. And we're concentrating on the distinctions between narrative poetry, poems that tell stories, and lyric poetry, the speaker simply sharing thoughts, feelings, insights to create a single unified impression. We're concentrating on imagery and the use of figurative language, words that and phrases that create unexpected comparisons or play with meanings. We're also concentrating on reading fluently, reading to adjust our reading rate, and of course, listening for the tone, all of those in, in bold on page 639. Hey, jump over to 656, 657 real quickly, just to remind on our assessment here for the poetry collection number two. We have some, again, vocabulary we want to be familiar with. And then on page 657, we meet very briefly Naomi Shihab Nye, born 1952. Uh, she began publishing. Uh, poetry in magazines when she was in high school. Her poetry often draws inspiration from the places where she's lived. St. Louis, Missouri, Jerusalem, and Israel, as well as her current home in San Antonio, Texas. Let's turn now to page 664, Making a Fist, which is an interesting title of a poem. And we're going to ask not only about the speaker in 2B, but jot this down in 2B. We're going to be very interested in the symbolism of this poem, so write that down. What is the key symbol, and in what ways does this poet, uh, Shihab Nye, um, produce that for us? A very brief poem, and yet I think very powerful. Let's go ahead now, just read along, and then we'll come back to make some observations. Making a Fist by Naomi Shihab Nye. For the first time on the road north of Tampico, I felt the life sliding out of me, a drum in the desert harder and harder to hear. I was seven. I lay in the car, watching palm trees swirl a sickening pattern past the glass. My stomach was a melon split wide inside my skin. How do you know if you're going to die? I begged my mother. We had been traveling for days. With strange confidence, she answered, when you can no longer make a fist. Years later, I smiled to think of that journey. The borders we must cross separately, stamped with our unanswerable woes. I who did not die, who am still living, still lying in the back seat behind all my questions, clenching and opening one small hand. Now, I have a lot of sophomores who really love this poem because of that final set of lines in this poem. But before we get there, Let's just concentrate for a few moments on the opening of the poem. I'm actually going to start, though, with 2B. I want us to pay attention to the organization for just a moment. Please notice this is a poem of three stanzas. Did you see that? Write that down in 2B. And in each stanza, something profound is going to happen, especially at the end of each stanza. Notice, we open in the first stanza with an observation that this was the first time in the speaker's life when it began to occur to the speaker, he or she, I, I think I'm going to die. That is to say, the recognition of death is one of those fundamental challenges in youth. Notice we are seven years old. By the way, let's just put this in 3A really quickly. You'll remember from your freshman year, I hope, that we did that poem called 15 by, uh, by Safford. Um, about a young boy who finds a motorcycle turned upside down in a field and somehow thinks that the motorcycle now belongs to him, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. And the poem's refrain kept being, I was 15, I was 15. That is to say, I was so tied up in my own world, it didn't occur to me that running motorcycles usually have a human being attached to them somewhere else. And he goes back and he finds the old man, of course, and he guides him up onto the, up onto the uh, asphalt, the road, and off the old man goes riding on his motorcycle. Here, notice... Seven, right? Laying in the back of a car, watching the palm tree swirl, a sickening pattern past the glass. In other words, not feeling well. Uh, a stomach, a melon split 
uh, why it inside my skin. Let's just write it down. Children become dramatic when they have these kinds of, I don't feel well, and then they have to get all fired up about it. Can we say this out loud? One of the biggest differences about being a sophomore, being a freshman, is that when you're a freshman, you wake up in the morning, you don't want to go to school, you fake like you're sick. When you're a sophomore, you're smart enough to realize, every day I fake like I'm sick and I don't go to school, that's another day I gotta make up a bunch of garbage, which if I don't make it up, leads to my in it, uh, possibly not passing the class, and then I might end up, for example, having to do something like summer school or something, because I couldn't get up in the morning and make myself do something I didn't want to do, right? I mean, it's kind of one of those strange oddities of becoming a sophomore, that the light bulbs start going off, that is to say, you wake up in the morning and you go, I really, really don't want to have to endure school today. But I really, really don't want to have to endure another kind of consequence. So I'm just going to get up and go. By the way, of course, as we'll say later when you're seniors, welcome to the rest of your life. Your life is a series of mornings that a lot of times you don't want to get out of bed and you don't want to have to go to work or do whatever it is you've got to do that morning, yes? That's called the rest of your life. And when that fact, let's call it a fact, shall we? When that fact settles on us, our first instincts are to go, I want out. Ugh, I think I'm going to die. Stanza one, stanza two. Notice it begins with a funny question, how do you know if you are going to die? Which is, of course, a really odd question. Can we put this in our notes? This is ironic, isn't it? Because the first time, we've said this many times in 303, the first time that you said goodbye to a goldfish floating on the top of the water, the first time that you had to put bury in the backyard a cat or a dog for you to pass, the first time, tragically maybe, you had to stand next to a hole in the ground and say goodbye to somebody in your family who you really loved, maybe somebody much older. You, it hit you. Oh. Of course, as we say often, they were teaching you this from the time you were quite young at the park. You were enjoying swinging. You did not want to go to the van. And, of course, you made it clear you did not want to go to the van. The adult in your life, however, made it clear back. Honey, as much as you love swinging at the park, you do not get to swing at the park forever. Everybody's got to go to the van. From a very young age, they were teaching this concept to you. Everybody's got to go bye-bye. You can't stay at the park and swing forever. You've got to go to the van. But notice the child. How do you know if you're going to die? Notice it's the mother, right? Out of that maternal wisdom, the mother will respond. When you can no longer make a fist, that's when you know you're dead. And you can almost see this little seven-year-old in the back seat making the fist over and over again to prove that he or she is not going to die. Stanza two. Stanza three. Now we're years later. Let's put this in our notes. We see this often in our poetry, where we go from a memory of the past now to the present, and in the present moment, the adult speaker of the poem is remembering back to a time in childhood when something profound was learned and it has affected, of course, everything that has transpired since. Years later, notice I smile. We can look back and laugh at our freshman year once we're sophomores. I mean, it's funny. I just mentioned that whole thing about get up in the morning and when you're a freshman, you can make excuses why not to go. But by your sophomore year, you realize the stupidity of that position. And several of you started smiling. Why? Because the moment I was describing that, I was taking you to a place that you no longer are as a sophomore. At least we'll hope you no longer are, right? That you can go back to that time when you were a freshman and you were kind of young, stupid, naive. You did not get it. You did not understand. And so you did the one thing that felt fun to do at that moment. That is what we call lack of delay of gratification. It didn't occur to you that doing something now would affect you later because you're stupid, you're young, you're a freshman. Now, as a sophomore, you look back and you go, ha, 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 We're, we got the same game being played. Notice she says, or the speaker says, later, I smile to think of that journey. Now, let's put this in our notes. I said to you that there's almost no story in the history of stories that's more profound in our psyche and in our thinking than Homer's Odyssey. It keeps coming back. Are you noticing this? It keeps coming back. Story after story after story has some version of the journey motif. 
That is to say, you start someplace and you end up some other place. And it's not the destination. It's the journey that somehow seems to matter. Can I say this out loud to you? I say this to my seniors every year. When you walk the track and the balloons go up and the mascara runs and everybody's having big parties about the fact you finally graduated from high school, it will not be that moment that will matter to you. It won't. What will matter to you is the 12 years of this thing called school that you finally are ending, at least for a while. Then you get to start it all over again. Great. Well, don't worry. We'll talk about that when you're a senior. But the reality is, there it is. You finally have done it. It won't be that moment of graduation. It will be the journey that got you there. All of the challenges along the way. Notice our poet speaker is talking now about the journey. And then notice the borders we must cross separately. Stamped with our unanswerable woes. In other words, there are questions which cannot be answered. Like... How do you know when you're going to die? Like, what's it mean to go on a journey and discover at the end of it, it was either a good journey or a bad journey? The meaning of all of this travel. I who did not die, who am still living, still lying in the backseat behind all my questions, clenching and opening one small hand. Now, of course, this final line takes us from a memory of the past to a moment now in the present where our speaker says, My whole life, since the moment my mother told me, you'll know you're no longer alive when you can't make that fist. And the speaker says, I'm still making that fist, opening it, closing, clenching it. This is still for me the key symbol that tells me I'm still alive. I'm not dead yet. If you can make a fist... You're not dead. Now that's level one. Let's jump to 2A really quickly. What is a poem like this actually about? One of the brilliant things about poetry is it can say things, as we've said often, say things without saying it, coming right out, coming right out loud. What is it that this poem speaks to you? What does it say to you about what it means to be alive? What it means to struggle? What it means to overcome the challenges of your life? And of course... Let's say it out loud at 2A. One of the obvious messages is life is struggling. Life is overcoming. Life is trying to find some way to find meaning and answer in the challenges of the pain of life. The challenges of I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna die. What am I of course when you're young, everything is catastrophic. When you get older, you start, to, as sophomores, you begin to realize in your sophomore year what real challenges you are. Of course, my seniors smile at you guys and say, seriously, you sophomores have no idea what real challenges are coming. Let me tell you about the real challenges, like the question that keeps coming to my seniors, what's going to happen the day after you graduate? Forget about graduation day. You still got a whole bunch of life to live. Let's call it 20 at graduation. You still got about 40, 50 years left to live. What are you going to do with all those years? You've only lived four of them of high school. What are you going to do? Like, what are you going to get up every morning and go, and, oh, dude, I'm going to work doing what? And why? And how are, you going to make, how are you going to make this thing called your journey meaningful? It's all about the struggle. Number two, let's put this one in our notes. What we learn in our youth as a child has tremendous influence later in our life. We keep coming back. Can we say this? We keep coming back to the old messages. I had a student once who kept getting in trouble sitting in the principal's office. Finally, he has this conversation with me and he goes, I don't know what's wrong with me. Every time I'm sitting in the principal's office in that famous chair in the principal's office, it always hits me. Here I am again. Here I am again. It's like I keep coming back over and over and over. What is wrong with me? Why can't I learn my lesson and like get on with this thing called my life? Why do I got to keep coming back to the stupid chair? The chair all of a sudden becomes the symbol. And then the student reads this poem and the student realizes, no, no, that's what living is. It's coming through life, but always drawing on these experiences from our youth, things we learn that we somehow don't let go of. Of course, here appropriated by a wise mother, who probably just gave an off-the-hand comment like, well, you know you're dead when you can't make a fist anymore, honey. Can you make a fist? Well, yeah. Well, then I guess you're not dead. It's only later 
that we began to recognize the symbolic power of a message like this. This notion of making a fist. Of course, let's put this in our notes at 2B. The fist is a symbol of what? Think about that. What does the fist represent? Some will see it as violence. In other words, you make the fist, you're about to punch somebody, you're about to fight, there's about to be some release of negative energy, etc., etc. But let's go ahead and say it out loud. The fist can also symbolize the struggle to stay alive, the struggle to survive. At 3A, when your seniors will come to these lines and you'll smile to remember this poem from your sophomore year, when we study the great play of Shakespeare called Hamlet, and the most famous lines of that play, some argue the most famous lines in the history of the English language, is a famous speech or soliloquy where Hamlet muses to be or not to be. That is the question whether it is noble in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or take arms against the sea of troubles by opposing in them. In other words, every morning you have a you know, challenge, you have a question. To be or not to be? To do or not to do? At the end of that speech, Hamlet says, conscience makes cowards of us all. We have this tendency to make up our mind we're going to do something, and then we fail. And then we recognize we didn't accomplish what we'd set out to accomplish. And then we got to like start all over again. Ugh. What is for you the text that tells you to keep going? Do you have a song on your playlist? Can I say it this way? Do you have a song on your playlist in the morning when you wake up and you're like, okay, bag it, I ain't going it, I ain't doing it. And then you go, no, no, no. I got to do this thing. I can't get out of this thing. Do you have a song that somehow speaks that to you? That speaks that truth to you? When you listen to it, you go, fine, fine, fine. I'll make the fist. One more time, I'll make the fist. What is that for you? Is there a text where the fist becomes symbolic for you? That is to say, has that special kind of meaning? Finally, at 3B, two questions. You knew this was coming. One, from your previous life, what's a time when you didn't make the fist? That is to say, you gave up, you quit. You were done with it. It's like, I've had enough of it. And you didn't decide to keep going. And then the obvious second question is, what's a time in your life when you made the fist? You found a way to get through. The fact your sophomores tells us you made it through their freshman year. It is natural for most freshmen to at some point in their freshman year begin to feel, I cannot do this. Think about how past accomplishments reward future challenges. Think about that. Because I'm a sophomore saying one morning, I'm done. I've had it. I cannot do this anymore. But wait. I felt that in my freshman year, and guess what? Now I'm a sophomore, which means I made it. Which means I made it. And if I made it through my freshman year, I can make it through my sophomore year. And if I can make it through my sophomore year, then maybe I can make it through my junior year. And it's always the refrain I give to my seniors. Dude, you have made it through 11 years of this insanity. Don't tell me you can't finish one more year. You've done 11 years. Let's get through 12, and let's call this thing done and get on with this thing called making a fist, staying alive. Well, I hope you enjoyed Shehab Naib's great little poem. Thank you.